All right, good morning, everybody, or actually early afternoon, 1201. Um, let's get started with our webinar today. Let's go over the housekeeping. Uh, appreciate you all uh, attending these, uh, signing up. We're trying to keep it, uh, you know, an hour long. Appreciate your uh, your time. Uh, recognize you're uh, doing this over lunch. So anyway, um, just today we're going to um, continue on with some IEQ where we're going to talk about the best practices for applications uh, with UVC uh, for surface and air treatment. Uh, we had a change in speakers. Uh, just uh, hope Steve Manju is feeling uh, better. Uh, just uh, Dean, our speaker is Dean Saputa. And, um, you know, basically he's a, a pillar kind of in the UVC uh, industry. So he has more than three decades of experience in ultraviolet air and surface treatment. He's a VP and co-founder of UV Resources. And then just regarding uh, UVC or UVGI, he's an active member on several ASHRAE technical committees and is a contributing author to the ASHRAE handbooks to two of the uh, uh, chapters in there. And then he's currently serving as a member of the on the ASHRAE ep Epidemic uh, Task Force uh, Committee, which we really appreciate being quickly uh, put together with the COVID uh, pandemic. So let me just uh, go over a couple housekeeping uh, items is that um, we're trying to keep everybody muted. There's a question and answer section. If you have any questions, uh, you know, please type them in there. We will monitor them as they're uh, being sent in and we'll try to answer those at the end. But if there is something pressing, we will interrupt uh, uh, Steve. And then just to uh, um, uh, just to uh, remind you is that um, we have a question and answer section. Uh, afterwards, we'll send you a copy of those. There's a survey if you can please uh, fill out. Um, it helps us with uh, uh, focusing on uh, what to uh, talk about, et cetera, like that. Uh, we'll have a link to the recording and then also PDH credits are available. So just uh, send uh, myself uh, an email if you're requiring them. And then just the last thing is uh, I want to say thank you to Gina O'Donnell. Um, she is uh, leaving us and we're going to have a new replacement with uh, Gianna uh, Salvatore. All right. So with that, let's uh, turn it over to Dean. Thank you once again all for attending. Jim, thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yep. Sounds good. Steve. Okay. Thank you. Let me get the screen up here so we're looking at it and then uh, get up and running here. Uh, so Dean Saputa, UV Resources. Um, thanks for the introduction on that. The, uh, we've seen quite a bit uh, over the last couple of years with the pandemic, and uh, hopefully today's presentation will help you a little bit under a uh, little bit more to understand how UV can be effective in HVAC systems for air or surface disinfection. I think one of the things we realized from years years ago that uh, UV has been applied mainly for sitting on cooling coils, and when the pandemic came about. Folks were, oh, we don't use UV, that's, that's for sitting on cooling coils. We're trying to kill something flying by in the air. But UV has been used for many, many years for things uh, flying by in the air. And it was just that, that paradigm shift to get people back to thinking about uh, UV as an air disinfectant. So hopefully we can give you a little bit of uh, insight into that. And I appreciate HC and I for hosting this and I appreciate everybody's time coming today. So uh, I've left other than this logo, there should be no other logos in the presentation. Uh, so today we're going to uh, talk about uh, delivering clean, healthy air with germicidal UVC. Our review today, we're going to do uh, germicidal UVC benefits. I'm going to go ahead and take my screen off. Sometimes I think that's a little distracting. Um, give me one second here. Okay, there, sometimes I, I think that's distracting. So germicidal UVC benefits, reducing HVAC energy use. That's really what we've been using UV for for quite some time, sitting on cooling coals, degrading the stuff inside the coals and keeping those system efficiencies. So that's boosting heat transfer efficiencies. We're gonna talk about that. Again, like I just mentioned a minute ago about disinfecting air streams. How do we disinfect air streams and improve indoor air quality? So the applications today as we go through our airstream disinfection or induct on the fly inactivation, something you may not be familiar with, but certainly something we've seen in the pandemic that has uh, resurged again is upper room or upper air UVC. So we'll cover that a little bit. 
And then HVAC coiled and surface cleaning, something you may already know about, but really the, as, as Jim had said, coming out of the epidemic task force, one of the things that we had to do was talking about what you should do inside facilities, uh, ventilate, filter, uh, UV, and how can we combine these technologies to be able to get you uh, a, a disinfectant air will not sacrifice in energy. So those are kind of some things we're going to cover today, but let's, let's do a quick slide or two about the basics of germicidal UVC. If you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, it covers everything from cosmic rays to microwaves, and inside that spectrum is going to be the visible spectrum. And these are things that we see from reds to violets. So the colors that we can see, but right above that spectrum is the ultraviolet spectrum. And that ultraviolet spectrum is divided into four categories, UVA, B, C, and what's called vacuum UV. Now this spectrum here is 100 nanometers to 400 nanometers in length. So we're not, when we talk about UVC, we're talking about something very specifically at the 253.7 or rounded to 254 nanometers. So it's not a tanning bed light. It's not a cancer causing portion of UV. It's not an ozone producing portion. For example, if you're gonna produce ozone, it's down here at 185. If you're gonna be tanning beds, you're up here in one, uh, uh, UVA. Now the interesting fact obviously is the sun produces all of these wavelengths, but what ends up happening with our ozone layer UVC gets rejected back because of the ozone layer. If those of you are old enough like me, you'll remember the days of hairspray where we where people were like, you can't use these aerosols because you'll put a hole in the ozone layer. Well, that was really because we didn't want UVC coming through. But UVC just, there's so many particles in the ozone layer that it just gets rejected off. UVA and B come through and that's what does the damaging to our tires, our, our convertible tops, things like that. But UVC does not come through the atmosphere. When you think about what UVC does, it's the natural germicidal portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And at 253.7, that waveform gets into a cell and it starts to damage the nucleic acid and proteins within that cell. It actually causes a thing called a thymine dimer lesion, breaking these, the DNA apart and causing a lesion called a dimer that cell can no longer reproduce, it can no longer feed, it becomes inactive, you cannot use it. So the cell no longer can, is, is active. So some of the benefits of UVC is the fact that we can be inside HVAC systems. We can get into cooling pools and we can start to degrade biofilms, mold, bacteria, things that are growing in this, uh, in this dark, moisture-rich environment. Right? We're stripping water out of the air with a cooling coil. And as that water is sitting in that dark moisture rich area, we start to grow things, right? Because we're catching things that get through the filters. It gets on the, the water droplet of the coil and then it starts to grow. We can disinfect airstreams. And then of course we can help uh, mitigate disease transmission. But the biggest thing that UV has been used for in the last oh, 30 years has been sitting around just making sure these systems are clean. So if we look at a, at a cooling coil, you know, we, it's condes this condensation that happens in that cooling coil, it starts to attract dust uh, and bacteria and things that are flying by in the air. It fouls those coils, fouls those fins. And as those fins get fouled, they start to, we start to lose efficiencies of an HVAC coil. It's restricting airflow, we don't get the heat transfer. So let's go into that a little bit deeper in this next slide. So if we take a brand new coil that we design at the factory and we have, let's say, a 500 foot per minute approach velocity, we're doing an eight row, 10 fins per inch coil. So 500 feet per minute fans blowing through the coil, that coil spacing between those fins is about 60% open, right? So eight row, 10 fins per inch. So as that 500 feet per minute goes into that coil, it starts to speed up because we have less space. We were 60% open. So that speed as it goes up, goes up to about 850 feet per minute, that interstitial velocity, the velocity through the inside of that coil. And then as it comes through there, we get a design temperature around 54 degrees of a wet bulb temperature. So if we turn and just take a small biofilm, which you obviously are familiar with biofilm, but six one thousandths of an inch, and we layer the top and bottom of those fins, 
Well, what ends up happening is we reduce that open face area by 9%. So our 500 feet per minute that's going into that coil has to speed up. So we don't have it at 850 anymore. We now have it at 1,000 feet per minute. So it gives us less time to exchange the heat, right? So now we, we end up with a wet bulb temperature of 58 degrees. So eventually, when we start looking at coils that are foul, we start to see that we can't meet temperature. We can't, uh, we can't get the airflow because these things are clogged up. So what ends up happening is we, we make some modifications to our systems, right? We get a person in the hospital who calls down and says, hey, I'm not getting any air here. Can you help me, facility manager? And the facility manager will turn around and speed up the fan. So if we speed up the fan, let's say that we reshiv it, and all of a sudden we're getting 600 feet per minute, what does the interstitial velocity do? It'll go up. So then what ends up happening is we don't get 58 degrees, we get 60 degree wet bulb temperature. So, well, that didn't work. So the speeding up the fan didn't work. So the next thing we do is we go to the chiller and we ask the chiller to, to, to start um, lowering the chilled water temperature, right? So we can get the heat to exchange or we start to increase the, uh, the water. So all these things start to add up to the point where we're costing energy because of foul coils. A really great case study that had uh, been published back in the mid 90s about mechanical cleaning of coils. This was a specific uh, uh, facility where they took the coils out and the coil on the left was put into this pan and they used as chemicals, pressure washing, steam, whatever they could get to see how well they could clean a coil where they had complete access. <clears throat> you can still see that in the middle of this coil, they still had a lot of impacting. And in that article, they actually spent hours trying to get, get this out of the coil. Now, same facility, different coil. They went through and said, let's just see what our years of coil cleanings have done. <clears throat> so they went ahead and took that coil and just cut it in half. And what you see is that the, the pressure washing and things that they did to clean that coil just impacted the second and third rows. And that starts to increase your pressure drop. Right, so it starts to increase your pressure drop, reduce your airflow, and of course, increase your wet bulb temperature. So all these things kind of add up. Then we're replacing coils or we're trying to clean coils once a year. So within ASHRAE, back when I was the chair of ASHRAE TC 2.9, we actually funded a study that was uh, looking at what UV would do inside HVAC systems. Matter of fact, Penn State was the one who won the, the contract. So one of the one of the uh, case studies was up there in uh, uh, State College. The other one was in Tampa. And what they had done is they went ahead and took the, these coils and they logged them for an entire year. They wanted to see what would happen, uh, what seasonally happens to these coils. So they logged them for an entire year and then they turned around and put UV on them for the next, for the next year. And so the next picture I'm gonna show you kind of shows you the pre picture of when they started this. And this is research paper 1738. And so this is when they, they already had logged the coil for a year. When, when they turned the lights on for the first time, they went to the opposite side of the coil. And I said, let's see how much visible light is coming through that coil. At the end of the study, you have the second, the second picture. So what you've got is that UV just ate up all of that stuff that's in the inside. Well, this was an energy study. So what it ended up showing is that that coil pressure drop decreased by 21% and the heat transfer went up by 14%. So with nothing other than just putting UV lights in there. So if you wanna read the study, I think it's 90 some pages, it's research paper 1738, ASHRAE. I have references at the end of the slides as well. So when we change courses a little bit and start looking at pathogen susceptibility, UV has an ability to inactiv inactivate anything with a DNA or an RNA. So some things are easier, some things are a little harder to do. So when you look at things like for, uh, viruses, influenza, measles, coronaviruses, smallpox, they're very susceptible to UVC. It doesn't take much energy to inactivate these, these um, viruses. As you start going up on the, going to the left, the harder things are gonna be fungal spores, right? bacterial spores. But most of the time in an HVAC system, this is something that's growing on the coils in the drain pans. So we don't necessarily need to try to inactivate it as it's flying by in the air. We're worried about what's happening in the drain pan, what's happening in the coil. And that's where these dark moisture rich environments 
start to breed these things here. But flying, things flying by in the air are much easier to do in these categories down here. So what we did in our epidemic task force is we, we have a whole section on germicidal. And one of the things that we talk about is, look, we can, we can inactivate things in less than a second. Matter of fact, in the ETF, we said in a quarter of a second is all that we need. So a quarter of a second. Uh, we can destroy 99% of pathogens. And then on the energy side, we can reduce energy use, boost heat transfer. And then remember, these do not produce uh, ozone and they're chemical free. So it's a really natural way to just clean your coils constantly by putting a light in there 24 seven, 365. So when we look at applications, a couple of the applications that we talked about in our preview slide was, we're gonna talk about surface cleaning, UV lights put in and around coils to just treat the coils, treat the drain pans, get those energy efficiencies, keep that system running the way you designed it. You designed that system, and we want it to stay that way. As it degrades over time, we start to get all those efficiency issues that we talked about. So you have UV lights downstream side of the coil, treating coils and drain pans. Then you have upper air fixtures. Again, we're gonna talk about that here in just a second, but these you may not be familiar with, but we certainly saw a resurgence of this technology during the pandemic, especially for facilities in the Northeast that don't have cooling, um, opening windows during the summertime. And then the, the last one is HVAC uh, airstream disinfection. So an interesting note, when you look at this here, you'll notice it's just a few more lamps. Uh, there's, there's in this, the coil cleaning, you got four lamps in this particular coil. This coil is 80 inches high, 96 inches wide, 24 inches deep. This is a, one of our OEM partners. And they put four lamps in here, enough to treat the coils, treat the drain pans. To do an air disinfection, we just have to add a little bit more light. But the interesting thing that you see in these two pictures is even though this one here is for surface and cleaning drain pans, it's still modeled out to achieve an 85% first pass inactivation of coronavirus. So even a cooling coil application still has some air disinfection. That's kind of the point. Now, over here on the left, adding more lamps, we were able to get to a 99% plus first pass inactivation. So we had seen in the pandemic, a lot of folks going this direction, put lots of lamps in, let's inactivate everything. But when you start looking at this here, we can get a decent inactivation, especially if you're designing six, eight, 10 air changes an hour, and maybe 85 is acceptable. And we just stay on coils and we treat drain pans and we just go ahead and get each time that air passes, we get an 85% or somewhere in that area, uh, air disinfection. So UV doesn't necessarily have to be in those coils. They can be in duct. They can be inside of a, a supply or a return duct. And what you're seeing here is stab-in type units that can stab in from the outside and can be easily modified for ducts. So if we have an event in a space, somebody coughing up, we can certainly have UV lights right in that return air duct. Could be in the supply duct too. Of course, we also can have them up in the HVAC system. There's a lot of reasons for putting UV in an HVAC system actually in the air handling unit. And part of that is because that's the slowest moving air within that system, right? We're gonna be slowest moving air by the filters, slowest moving air by the cooling coils. So an opportune, uh, optimum spot for us is to be by cooling coils because it's the slowest moving air, which means we have more residence time with the micro that's going by. But we can certainly put them in and size them for air disinfection as they're going by in the air in ducts. So I mentioned to you, we're gonna talk a little bit about upper room UV. And so I'm gonna just show you a quick video here. Since onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, UVC light or electromagnetic energy in the germicidal UVC wavelength has become a key technology in mitigating the spread of the deadly virus. The technology's popularity dates back nearly a century when scientists discovered that the sun's UV energy destroys germs and bacteria. In less than a second, UVC light can inactivate pathogens, essentially neutralizing infectious diseases. To illustrate how easily infectious pathogens can spread, we used a computer simulation to model a student sneezing in the middle of a classroom. The simulation shows what scientists already know. Aerosols expelled during coughing, sneezing, or even talking 
can travel with room air more than 30 to 40 feet. This same process occurs repeatedly in commercial offices, restaurants, grocery stores, TSA checkpoints, and doctor waiting rooms. To determine the effectiveness of UVC upper room fixtures, we conducted a side-by-side -side comparison with two classrooms, one fitted with germicidal UVC fixtures and the other without. These wall-mounted fixtures shine ultraviolet light across the top portion of the room, safely above people's heads. During this simulation, notice how quickly infectious aerosols are inactivated in the bottom classroom, which is fitted with upper room UVC fixtures. The germicidal energy renders harmless the majority of the airborne pathogens. The infection mitigation impact of the germicidal fixtures becomes clear. In spaces without UVC, such as the top classroom, contagious droplets can linger for several minutes, and the longer someone is exposed to viral particles, the more likely they are to become infected and allow further spread of the disease. Here's how it works. Upper room fixtures use the natural rise and fall of convection and mechanical air currents to lift pathogens overhead and into the UVC zone. The 253.7 nanometer UVC wavelength attacks a germ's DNA or RNA, rendering it harmless and unable to reproduce. And since the UV energy is overhead, occupants are safe to go about their normal business. In fact, this natural disinfectant works so well that the CDC and ASHRAE recommend UVC to slow the spread of the deadly COVID-19 disease. By eliminating airborne allergens, bacteria, and viruses, upper room UVC fixtures stop pathogens cold. They're perfect in emergency rooms, nursing homes, doctor's offices, classrooms, or anywhere groups of people congregate. To recap, UVC inactivates infectious microbes, leaving them unable to reproduce. Upper room UV fixtures installed near a room ceiling neutralize microbes as they circulate. Upper room UVC fixtures have a long scientifically proven history of inactivating airborne pathogens, with concentrations further reduced with each subsequent pass of recirculated air to the upper room. Mother Nature's own Germany where UVC helps halt the spread of airborne diseases so people are safer and healthier. So UV's been around for quite some time, back in the 1930s. Uh, upper room UV got its start actually in Philadelphia. It was for Philadelphia Public Schools, a suburb of Philadelphia. And they put UV, and that's these pictures here, uh, these ultraviolet lights up on the wall. These are pointing upward, not kind of what you saw in this picture here, but these are pointing upward because it was a tall ceiling. But uh, what they saw was really uh, the classrooms that were equipped with UV only had about a 13% infection rate, where classrooms or other areas that did not were 53%. So they saw a large reduction in, in um, the population with those that had UV within those spaces. So they've been around for a long time. This is an 80 plus year technology and uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, documentation on it. So these are really systems that would be on a wall. They would be a minimum of seven feet, maybe eight feet up mounted. They send a very a specific collimated beam of UV out of underneath the ceiling. You don't want the beam hitting the ceiling. It's gotta be just below the ceiling. Uh, that means that the rays are not coming down into where the occupants are. So it's safe for the occupants in that space. Uh, they can be either wall mounted fixtures such as you're seeing here, something like this. These baffles will help collimate that beam. But then you have large spaces that can actually take um, you could have a baffled one that could be up to 150 to 300 square feet, and you can have an open fixture that doesn't have those baffles, which would be for larger, larger spaces. Um, we've certainly seen a, a lot of um, folks that have gone this direction, and really where we see these going into is gymnasiums, cafeterias. Uh, the CDC document actually is cafeterias and gymnasiums, and we can certainly provide that to you as well. But this here is just an illustration of what would happen within a gymnasium. But they can handle a much bigger space because the ceilings are taller here. So certainly something to think about. They've been around. Pennsylvania was where they started, so uh, in Philly. So quite a bit of information within ASHRAE about that as well. So let's move on to coil cleaning, which would be the next slide here. Uh, I'm going to just show you one quick little video as well. For years, building managers and HVAC technicians have battled to control indoor temperature. 
Once an HVAC system is installed, an insidious biological enemy starts chipping away at heat transfer efficiency as mold and biofilm build up on the coils. Left untreated, these little organic monsters slash heat exchange efficiency by nearly 15%. This results in up to 25% higher HVAC costs, in addition to very uncomfortable occupants. Think of mold, biofilm, and other organic compounds like a layer of insulation. The thicker that insulation, the harder your system must work. To meet demand, operators often attempt to compensate by speeding up fans, pumping more chilled water, or lowering system water temps. But many HVAC insiders have turned to germicidal lamps to remove microbes from fouled coils and guard against their return. UVC energy disrupts the microbes' DNA, so this zombie apocalypse is never going to rise from the grave. Whether your system is brand new or has years of accumulation, the germicidal wavelength kills microorganisms dead. It's hard to imagine that a few UVC lamps can protect cooling coils, but scientists haven't found a microbe that can withstand Mother Nature's own germ removal. Once the microbes are eliminated, the conditioned air gets better, cooler, and cheaper. Installation is easy and costs less than 15 cents per CFM. Once installed, UVC lights patrol your HVAC system around the clock. Maintaining them is literally as easy as changing a light bulb each year. Okay, quick recap. Damp, dark spaces breathe coil-clogging gum restricting air and heat transfer. If UVC light is installed, it kills the gum, cleans the coils, and restores system efficiency. Costs decrease and air quality is restored. The occupants are happy and the bottom line is happy. So that kind of recapped a little bit about what we talked earlier, but just to go a little bit deeper into what, how UV works in and around those coils is, UV has a very high reflectivity off of surfaces that are made of aluminum. You can see here aluminum's quite high in reflectivity. Well, typically your cooling coil fins are gonna be made of aluminum. So we can actually start to send that UV energy through reflection down the pack depth, thus cleaning it out. So you don't need a ton of energy sitting on a cooling coil to be able to, to take care of what's there. As a matter of fact, within our ASHRAE handbook, we only said you need what's called 100 microwatts. Doesn't need, that's not a lot because it's a, it's a solid surface sitting there getting UV energy 24 seven, 365. We can keep that surface clean. So when you're designing new units, if we put UV lights in at the beginning, we can keep those surfaces clean, right? We can keep them the way that they were designed. Or we take a 10, 15 year old system and we can recover it, kind of what you saw in that research paper that was done by ASHRAE. So, it's, it's the fact of the aluminum fins help us get that energy down into that pack depth. Again, uh, just downstream side of the coal seems to work the best. And let me just reiterate that. When you're taking uh, a cooling coal and you're stripping water out of the air, you really don't start to see microbial growth until you get to the middle of the coil to the back side of the coil. So as our energy is coming out of this lamp, we want the highest amount of energy to hit the drain pan, and what we would call the wet or moldy side of the coil. And then as we're sending that energy down that pack depth back into that coil, we start to lose energy as it's reflecting, reflecting, reflecting. Well, we're going back to the dry side of the coil. So we don't necessarily, if you walk into a cooling coil, you don't necessarily see mold growing right here. You see mold growing on the downstream side, which is where we want the UV lamps. That's the most advantageous place. Now this is kind of, the, the crescendo of the whole thing here. One of the things that we did in the epidemic task force a couple of years ago, when we had done that, we said, you got to put either ventilate or put MERV 13 filters in. Well, once that happened, we started getting a lot of pushback from facility folks that systems that could not handle MERV 13 filters. You got a higher static pressure, uh, the, the filters load up faster, they have to change out more often, and they're three or four times more expensive for a MERV 13. 13 versus a MERV 8. So one of the things we did in our company is we looked at it and said, well, look, what if we take something like a MERV 8 filter and let's see how that does with UV combined. So what does a MERV 8 filter do? 
What does a MERV-13 filter do? And this is off of coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. And what is the two together, a MERV-8 and uh, just enough UV that sits on a cooling coil, right? So put the, put the UV in for cleaning the coils, keep your MERV-8, and what do those two things do together? And uh, I just uh, had an article published in last month in Engineered Systems that talked about this. So if you've read it, hopefully this will is just a recap. But basically, if you take a MERV-8 filter, it's only going to capture about 20% of the SARS-CoV-2. And again, why Epidemic Task Force said, hey, let's move to MERV-13, because a MERV-13 can get about 85% capture rate. So now what we did is said, well, wait a second. You know, we, we heard these issues of static pressure, or system, you know, system uh, struggling for air because of the MERV-13 filter. What does the combination of the two do? So we ended up taking a, a MERV-8 filter, coil cleaning UV, and sent it to an ANSI ASHRAE 185 test chamber. So again, it's a promulgated test, something that, that they have to, they just run it per the test standards. We don't tell them what to do. They just run it for the test standards. We were able to achieve over 99% capture kill rate with a MERV-8 filter in UV. So this is a game changer for folks, right? So let's go ahead and keep the MERV-8 filters, let our airflow go through, keep our static pressure down, get longer change outs on those filters. Let's put UV at the cooling coil so that we can treat it for what we just talked about, uh, treating the drain pans, keeping those coils clean. But those two things together can achieve a, above a MERV-13 efficiency. And in the test, it came up as 99.9%, .9%, which was amazing. So let's do a quick recap on this. So if you look at where you're going to put UV lights, obviously the best location is on the downstream side of the coil. Wet side of the coil, downstream side of the coil, that's where the mold, the bacteria, things are growing. If you don't have room down here, you can pl place UV on the upstream side of the coil, but we caution you there in the fact that UV could degrade filters. So you need to make sure that those filters are, are UV safe. I still say the best location downstream side of the cooling pools is where you want to be. So all that's really needed to be able to size UV for an HVAC system is the height and width of this box. Tell me what this box dimension is here, and we can tell you how many UV lamps would go into that space. So let's it, just summarizing, you know, UV can help disinfect air streams. We can uh, mitigate disease transmission. We talked about the energy efficiencies, you know, decreasing the HVAC energy, uh, boosting the heat exchange efficiency. It's a very extensively peer-reviewed product. It's been around for, for over 100 years in water, about 120 years in water. And then it's been 80 years in upper room. So definitely around a, a long time. And we can destroy pathogens in a quarter of a second, less than a second. It doesn't produce ozone, no chemicals or ozone. Uh, coming out of it, continuous 24-7 cool cleaning, just let it sit there, work 24-7, um, boost heat transfer, decrease energy efficiency. The presentation, which I think Jim's going to send to you, is going to have some links to all of the different references that I have in here. So whether they be ASHRAE position documents, uh, handbook, uh, different articles, I have those all at the back of this. So Jim, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I'm going to put my video back on and see if we have any questions. Okay. Um, yep. Back. Uh, so one question so far, uh, Dean. Uh, so it's uh, it was referencing the Penn, Penn University of Penn study, but it's really applicable to any um, existing, you know, old uh, coil system where you're then adding uh, UVC lights to it. So the question is, if the UV yeah killed or inactivated the coil, the coil's uh, film slash slime, you know, slash gunk, did it have to be mechanically removed afterwards or did it fall out, uh, fall off or blow away, you know, into the airstream on its own? Well, that's a, that's a great question. So what's happening with UV is it's happening on a mono layer at a time. Remember, I'm working 24-7, 365, working on that. So if we're on the coil, what will end up happening, and this is the best way I describe it, is, a, it is all you have is a piece of aluminum, right? And a piece of aluminum now has a biofilm on it. Usually it's the oil that comes from the factory, right? And that starts the biofilm process. 
UV is going to start to degrade that, and then the air in the water that's on that coil sloughs it off down into the drain pan. Another reason we want to have that UV above the drain pan as well. So as, as we expose a monolayer at a time, air water sloughs it off, next, next uh, we then can expose the next layer, then the next layer, and the next layer. And if what was interesting, I didn't mention it to you in that Penn State study, was that, that most of the stuff happened within the first 90 days with that coil. So although the study was a year, almost all of that happened in 30, 60 days um, within that study. So taking that old degraded coil that you could barely see the lamp through, um, that happened within less than 90 days. I think it was 60 days if I remember the study correct. So yeah, it just kind of sloughs off. It doesn't go blowing downstream. It's still got, it's still got some, some um, moisture to it so it comes down into the drain pan and washes out of the drain. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the next question, um, I'm going to uh, um, interpret this that he is asking about the, the bulbs that are located in the airstream. Um, it's a two part, it is what is the heat gain uh, from the bulb? Um, you know, how much uh, energy or heat does it add to your cooling load potentially? And then the second part is what are the electrical requirements? What is the electrical load? Great, great questions again. Um, so ultraviolet lamps are very similar to fluorescent lamps. As a matter of fact, they're built on the exact same line. So the only difference between a germicidal lamp and a fluorescent lamp is that the glass is different and you remove the phosphor. So a fluorescent lamp has junk glass and phosphor. A germicidal lamp has got high purity glass and no phosphor. Why I say that is we know that the heat of a fluorescent lamp is very, very minimal. And so is the heat load of a germicidal lamp. You wouldn't even be able to pick it up. Uh, you could actually walk into the system and touch the lamp. I wouldn't advise it because the germicidal, but it's, there's no really heat gain of that as well. From electrical, most everything that you see is going to be single phase 120 to 277. So the most of the ballasts today that operate germicidal lamps will be auto switching ballasts. So they'll take any load, 120, 208, 230, 277, 240, whatever single phase you can get, it'll, it'll auto switch to it. And I'll, I think we're going to do a product review next. I can kind of cover that, but hopefully I answered that question. Okay, great. Thank you, Ian. Um, okay, next is, do the UV bulbs lose their effectiveness over time? If yes, oops, sorry, I keep on getting new questions. <laughs> if, yes, okay. how often, yeah, if yes, how often do they need to be replaced for optimal performance? Again, another good question. And so just like lights in your home, UV is going to start to degrade over time. Now, the manufacturers are, are usually off-the-shelf manufacturers. What I mean by that is Philips, Osram, GE, right? They make fluorescent lights, so they make germicidal lights. So most of those manufacturers guarantee the lamp to be 9,000 hours or a year's time. Now, we use a lot of Philips lamps. Philips is the world's largest manufacturer of, of ultraviolet lamps. And they guarantee that that lamp will only degrade 15% in 9,000 hours. So when we're sizing something, we already size it to the end of the life of the lamp. But here's where I kind of go. Even in my own home, I don't change my lamp out for, but every two years because I know there's still a, there's still life in it. However, the warranty is still there. It is gone. It's kind of like you have a three-year, 36,000-mile warranty on your car. It doesn't mean your car ends at three years. You can still go on, just understand that it's out of warranty. So I usually say, if you're, if you're in a situation where you're trying to kill something flying by in the air, go ahead and change those lamps annually, right? That's what the Philips or the manufacturer's guarantee is. If you're doing coil surface type stuff, go at a two year period of time, 18,000 hours, but get them out because eventually they'll start to, to degrade the ballast as well. So that was a good question. Okay, great. Thanks again, Dean. Uh, next, yeah, you want, you, how many do you want to take? I got about 10 minutes on the product review and then we can take some more questions or I can answer them offline either way. Okay. I mean, I would, uh, you know, let's... Um, uh, uh, can I take another one? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so how does UVC perform uh, when you're using copper fins in lieu, in lieu of aluminum fins? 
Good question. So copper is not as reflective as aluminum. So what ends up happening is you have to size a few more lamps in there or size them closer together to compensate for the reflectivity uh, loss of copper. So yeah, copper still works well. I uh, just have to size them a little bit differently. So if you are going to let somebody know, uh, a, a manufacturer know, let them know their copper fin coils because they have to size them a little bit differently. But still would work to get energy down in that space. Okay, great. One, two, three. Okay, so we've answered uh, four questions. Let's do one more, Dean, and then we'll leave the yeah. next five uh, for afterwards. So in older units, uh, when you're uh, installing UVC lights, what sort of protection needs to be taken to avoid degradation of wiring, uh, insulation, uh, gasketing, et cetera, like that? Uh, that? Another great question. So uh, one of the things we did with an ASHRAE is we went ahead and studied about 50 of the most common things UVC would be around within an HVAC system. So we looked at we looked at filters, we looked at uh, wiring, we looked at um, vibration isolators, we looked at all different kinds of fan belts, all these things that we had tested and the University of Dayton actually won that. And we subjected, subjected those to very high doses of UV and then said, all right, let's see how well, it, how well they maintained or what happened to them. And what we found is UV is pretty detrimental. Okay, you're like, don't say that. It's detrimental, but it's not very deep penetrating. So what we found is a lot of things were okay. It would get a surface oxidation, so to speak, but because UV, as you remember, it can't get through the ozone layer. So when I get to a piece of plastic, I will hit that piece of plastic, I'll start to degrade it, but it kind of self anodizes itself. So I can only go down to two to three microns in depth. Now, on the other side of that, the things that we found were the most detrimental, we're going to be any filter, you heard me say that in one of the slides there too, that is made of synthetic media. The synthetic media will actually degrade around UV. Again, if I'm on the downstream side of the coil, I'm not necessarily by that filter, so I don't have to worry about it. But if I was shining light on that filter, I need to make sure that filter is made of glass media. Glass cannot be degraded. Number two, wiring. The very first thing we did is we stripped color out of the wires. So we recommend that they be covered in conduit or aluminum tape and that aluminum tape just tape just reflects that uv energy off and the last thing that we saw was armaflex spongy pipe wrap the uh, black pipe wrap that goes around to wrap that with aluminum tape but those were the three things we found the, the worst that would the uv would degrade but good question um jim i'll go on and we'll okay. answer yeah, questions. We'll, uh, uh, bob we'll take your question next obviously all right thank you yeah oh thank you sorry about that uh so no, really ahead. From the PDH side of it, that's what we want to do. And, and Jim had asked me just to do some, I think looking at pictures of things of installations helps at least me understand how these things can be applied. So I really tried to just pull a couple pictures together to show you how these things are applied. So in just a product overview, um, we could be looking at something in our mix of products. We have everything from large systems, duct mount to we saw upper room type products. And then we can get into residential, uh, we can get into small VAB boxes or uh, uh, fan coil units. And then again, externally mounted stuff. So if you look at this product mix here, the products that we see that represent probably 90% of, of the business that's out there is gonna be one, this larger system or a duct mount. These three in the top are gonna to be probably the ones you're gonna see the most of. These are just supplementary type ones, certainly fill, fill gaps. But if we take a look at large systems, it would be a product that we call an RLM Extreme. And you saw this in several of the pictures. These are systems that would sit in and around larger HVAC systems. Again, sized by height, width, depth of the space. We have a really nice relationship with a lot of original equipment manufacturers and uh, a lot of them install them there at the factory. As a matter of fact, the, these two that you're seeing were factory mounted um, with one of, the, one of our vendors. Um, but the nice thing about these systems is that they come complete. Like if you're doing a retrofit on a job site and you give the height and width of the coil and we can put it in and Jim can put it into our software program, He'll ship you everything that needs to be installed, including framing supports, door switches, um, ballast enclosures, wires, um, 
light switches, everything that you need for the contractor to turnkey it on site. So what that would look like would be something like this. So you have a enclosure on the outside, right? This has your ballast in the inside and you have framing supports that go in on the inside. Uh, they would usually be put onto the ribs or back on the back part. Again, just, just a picture. These wires then come back up and go into the ballast enclosure. So framing supports look something like this, where these framing supports, as you saw in the picture before, they'll just hold the lamps, floor to ceiling uh, type framing supports. But one of the things we're seeing a lot of lately is getting the opportunity to, to uh, monitor what's happening with these UV lights. So one of the things we have inherent within our, our larger system, this product called an RLM Extreme, is they have current sensors inside of the box. And if you can see this ballast enclosure, this actually has six current sensors. You can see them by the green LED lights. So mechanical person walks by, he sees the green LED lights on, he recognizes everything's working. He can also send those signals down to the BMS or to the BAS. So he, these are the current sensors that are in there and they're sensing to say, hey, look, lamp is running, ballast running, everything is fine. Let me send the signal that everything's running fine. If a lamp or a ballast fails, then that signal stops and it sends a signal to the BMS. So what you saw is these are the current sensors. They can be put to one type of board here. So you're only sending one signal to the BMS. And the system would look something like this. So you would have your ballast enclosures here. You would have this, this board here that goes to the BMS. And you're just sending one signal to the BMS, basically saying, these six, these eight lamps are running, everything's fine. If one of them fails, we can, we can send a technician up there to look at it. So we're seeing a lot more with that. This is, a, again, an indoor application that you're looking at here. What you also see is, I just wanted to show you a couple other pictures. Here's a, a picture of a system installed, lamps going in. And then here's a pretty large system. This is actually 64 lamps that are being installed within a system. Um, you know, big built up unit. So uh, pretty large system. So we can go anything for small to large. One of the things I wanted to mention for the, the engineers that are here, there is a master spec and the master works um, specification for ultraviolet lights. There was it, we, we helped work with master spec in 2016 to write a section for antimicrobial ultraviolet lights. So uh, it's section 2.3. 0566. I just took a snippet of it here. We can send you that, that master spec too. It's a Word document, so you can edit it as you need to. Or if you do belong to master spec or master works, you can pull 230566 down as well. Now, in the Northeast, where you guys are, we do see some applications where velocities are pretty great through a duct. We don't have room in the air handling unit, but we, we want to put these into a duct system. We do see sometimes where we're putting those lamps in a uh, parallel to airflow. So as airflow is going through here, gives us a longer exposure time to the product as it's going by. Uh, the nice thing with this type of product is it gives a 360 degree distribution of energy. So all of that energy from all of those lamps is hitting that microbe as it's going by. So higher velocity systems, we can do this where you don't have room in the air handling unit. So that's kind of the, the RLM extreme. As I said, the second one that we see is the duct mounted. Um, this really, since the pandemic, was a product that we launched that is a dual lamp uh, fixture and it's outdoor NEMA rated. So it can sit on a rooftop. We did a really, really nice big project uh, up, up your way for a grow facility that had quite a few of these in there. I think there was 600 of these or something. Um, so these are some images of what they would look like sitting like in an indoor unit. They can just be mounted in these little indoor units. And you can see the lamps just stabbed through uh, in the outs, uh, uh, in through the ductwork. And just another image would be here's one sitting on a ductwork, kind of mimicking what I showed you earlier. These are dual lamp systems. So this, this power supply, this ballast will, will drive two lamps. And then you still have the signaling device that you can send to a BMS if you want to right there as well. And then lastly, I want to just kind of share um, of these upper air fixtures. We do have them in several sizes. We have them for smaller ceilings, which would be uh, 12 feet and below. It's important that 
you would only use this fixture here when you have high ceilings, cafeteria, um, gymnasium, auditorium. But for classrooms and uh, nursing care facilities, we've certainly seen a big uh, resurgence in nursing care facilities and classrooms, that these are the type of fixtures that can go in there and they cover certain amounts of square feet. So you could have multiple, like you saw in that video, multiple of them in a room. And then this particular one would be higher ceilings. So they can cover much larger areas because of the high ceilings. And this just kind of gives you a breakdown. So what's ended up happening here is you have a reflector in here that's actually sending that energy forward. And as that energy goes forward, it starts to collimate that, that UV energy into beams that come out. So I just wanted to share with you a few things because I think some actual pictures kind of help you to understand the application of them. Jim, I'm back to you. Okay, great. Uh, we'll return to the questions. So um, uh, the first question is, or the next question rather, is are there any health concerns of human exposure to UVC rays? Sure. You know, UVC is a, will, will inactivate anything that's with a DNA, right? So when we're an HVAC system, as per UL 1995, you have to have door safety switches, you have to have light switches, you have to have warning signs. So we don't want anybody exposed to UV. Um, what you saw in the previous stuff in the pictures here below, these, these are in spaces where, where it's above the occupant's head, right? So if you have a technician who's not trained, gets on a ladder, gets into that space, you know, you have to have him trained not to do that. These fixtures have been around for 80 some years. So they've been very, very well documented as long as you, know, you don't go in and change a, a, a fan belt with the fan on, right? You don't go up into the ceiling with the, with the ceiling fan on. So it's just a training thing. But yeah, really UV is detrimental to skin and eyes. So you just you know, make sure you take the safety precautions. Okay, great, thank you. And then uh, next question is if you have a large air handler where the air moving uh, through it is greater than 500 feet per minute, uh, the air will likely have a contact time of less than a quarter second. Um, how large were the units when the tests were run and what was the speed of the air through the unit? I'm not sure if Anastasia, if you're referring to the, um, the uh, uh, Penn State um, survey or, or, or field, um, testing or the um, the slide that had the uh, velocities through the unit? I presume it's the, um, the the Penn State study. Well, the Penn State, I'd have to go back and look at the research paper. Um, it's a, about 100 and some pages. Um, but I think those were at 350 to 400 feet per minute. But in the testing that we had done with the MERV-8 and, and the uh, UV light that I mentioned, again, just we think a game changer in this industry, that was done in an ASHRAE 185.1 test chamber. So that basically says that's at 500 feet per minute. Um, now, you're absolutely right. As, as the speed goes up, your residence time gets down, goes down. So you end up doing one of two things. Either you increase your length, right? So if I go from two feet to four feet and my speed goes up, I still get the same residence time or I increase my lamps to get the dose. So we can compensate for either one of those. During the pandemic, we've done a lot of systems that were 2,000 feet per minute, 1,500 feet per minute, 1,000 feet per minute. So we can compensate for those as well. So yeah, you're right, is that as the speed goes up, residence time goes down. We had to put something in the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force. We just said, basically, if you have 500 feet per minute, it's a quarter of a second, you should have this. So, but yeah, we can compensate for whatever velocities. Okay, I mean, in addition, if it's, uh, you know, there's, there's the output changes if the, the the UVC light is put upstream of the cooling coil because the uh, air is technically warmer than the downstream side. So that that would also be taken into account. Absolutely, okay. you, yep. you could put it on the upstream side if you have if you don't not going to degrade filters, and you get thirty percent more output of the lamp at seventy five degrees than you do at fifty four degrees. So if you have the room upstream and you're just doing air disinfection and you're not going to degrade filters it's a great location for them, but you're not going to get the benefits of cleaning the coil, cleaning the drain pans because, yeah, so it's really, that's why we kind of push you 
push you back yep. towards oil, you know? Yep. Great. Okay. Um, there was um, one of the slides, there was an estimated cost of 15 cents per CFM. They're asking if the cost includes, is that the cost of the equipment and the labor to install? Uh, we, we don't know labor to install. You know, when you get into areas that are new, uh, union, it's really the cost of the product um, and what it would probably be a markup from our local distributor. And that's for coil cleaning only that you saw in that video. So then you still have installation costs. So, so take that into consideration as well. Most of the time what we see is that the energy savings from the UV, which happens within about the first 90 days, usually can pay for the system, including installation costs in less than a year. So it's, it's a pretty dramatic payback. As you saw in that Penn State, you know, most of that stuff happened 30, 60, 90 days. And you, know, you dropped 21% in, in, in uh, coal pressure drop, increased 14% in heat, heat exchange efficiency. You run that into a, a calculator at 13, 15 cents per kilowatt hour, that's big money. Okay, great, thank you. Next two questions um, have to do with air ionization, so I'm gonna combine them. Yeah. Uh, the first one is, can you compare this to air ionization? And then the second part is, uh, can UVC be used in conjunction with bipolar ionization? So uh, I think that uh, HCNI also offers ionization, is that correct, Jim? Yes, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, I, we're, I, we're talking today just about UV lights and the benefits of UV lights. I think that I always write, like to refer folks to whatever ASHRAE has. There's some good documents within ASHRAE. I think if you go back and in these, if you don't mind me just going back a slide or two, that uh, in the back of this referencing material are some good pieces of information for you that would be good to read, uh, mainly like this infectious disease, also this uh, position document on filtration and air cleaning. That one was done in 2015. Uh, I was one of the authors of that. Uh, we are redoing that right now, that 2015 one. Uh, we're hoping to get it out, we, we hope before the end of the year, but it does have comments in there of, of different technologies, including ionization, filters, UV. So I, I would refer you back to those things to look at. So uh, I left it up here. It, it, you can just Google ASHRAE position documents uh, on filtration air cleaning. I think it's a good reference material for you to go and look at. All right, great. Thank you, Dean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, just a few more. Um, does uh, UV resources offer films slash covers or safety devices uh, for uh, access doors on AHUs to prevent the UVC light from being uh, visible outdoors? Um, are there other uh, safety devices that uh, can, you know, help with, uh, you know, uh, people entering into the, uh, you know, inside a large air handler. Yeah, and so, so you know, being in this industry for almost 20 years, what's really amazing is that the that the windows and air handling unit, uh, windows and air handling units cannot transmit UVC. We've tested almost all the manufacturers um, of the different OEMs. They've sent us windows, and we cannot get UVC to transmit through that glass. The glass is junk glass. So we can see colors through it. We can see, but we cannot get UVC to penetrate through that glass. We can't, this is a little maze people. I can't get through plexiglass. I can't even get UVC through a piece of cellophane, All right? And so the glass in the windows, we actually have a letter that we can send you as well. But unless they're making those windows out of quartz, then we're not gonna be able to transmit UVC through. Now, I think that makes people nervous so if you understand that I can't get through a piece of cellophane, that any window film would also prevent UV from, UVC from coming through. But right now we haven't found a window in an air handling manufacturer that we can that we can get UVC to get through. So, right. And then I'll just add. Um, so they all UVC resources also offers kill switches where if you do open the door. The UVC light inside will turn off. And then in addition, they have like a safety warning sticker that can be put on the outside also too. You know, yeah, very, yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, very cheap, inexpensive options. Truthfully, I think we almost always include them with our quotes. 
and okay. they come automatically, whether you use them or don't. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, you, I, I'm on the UL1995 committee, and uh, and it, it's a requirement. So they they come with it. If you don't install them, that's your own fault. But yeah, you really what you really want is to have a light switch that says UV lights. So you turn them off before you go in, and a warning a warning sticker. And then if you don't, and you open that door, it shuts them down. Right. So you have redundant switching. So, but good, Jim. You're you're right. Okay. Great, thank you, uh, Dean. Uh, next question, I'm gonna kind of paraphrase. So um, oftentimes uh, utilities offer rebates for energy savings if you provide high efficiency filter savings and therefore can reduce the outside air requirements. Um, have you ever attempted to uh, utilize rebates uh, for providing UVC lights on the basis of increased uh, efficiency, you know, energy, basically on uh, providing energy savings. Like a, Absolutely. You know. <laughs> okay. it's, it's a struggle because, you know, I, I ended up meeting with Duke Energy years ago and showed them the, what we showed here. And Duke Energy is, uh, I just used this as an example, and then I'll explain. I'm sorry, I'm taking so long, but the, um, um, they love it. The fact is that the payback is less than two years. They kind of go, well, we don't have the money to give you a rebate. You should be doing it anyway. So when I was talking to Duke Energy, I said, oh, did I say it's nine, nine or 90 days? I meant two years. And so it wasn't that. But so far, we've seen two, two uh, places that have actually adopted UV and rebates. And that would be the Salt River Project, which is out of Arizona. So you put UV lights in, you get $30 per ton rebate. And also the Tennessee Valley Authority, Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA. So if you put UV lights in, uh, you get a $30 per ton rebate. So it's a matter of just kind of taking those templates and moving them to other utility companies. But yeah, the, the benefits are there. And it's just a matter of getting them to buy into it. Right. Seemed to make sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last uh, question, Dean. Um, so, does it make sense to add uh, UVC light uh, on the interior of an air handler, and then put in a second uh, system that is duct mounted uh, downstream of the coils or downstream of the uh, equipment? So, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of that. We saw where there was, they decided to go ahead and have a system that was for air disinfection that they could turn on when cold and flu season would happen, or, and then just one for cooling coil applications. I still try to push you back to the coil because the coil is going to be the slowest moving air in the system. And it goes back to that question earlier about residence time. That's going to give us the slowest moving air. And I'd rather size more lamps there because it's gonna cost you less money to do it. And I can get more benefit from clean coils, energy savings, you know, all that, than putting it in the ductwork. Sometimes we're limited. Sometimes we just don't have room in those eight, in the air handling units that the only choice we have is in the duct. The advantage to the duct is sometimes we have very long duct runs. So we have longer exposure time to, to, um, to the pathogen, but we also have to compete with higher velocities. So it really is going to be a case by case study. I can make a case for either one of those, but um, I, I would move it back into the pool before I'd start putting more into the ducts personally. Right. Yeah. And I'll just, you know, chime in that usually the, the air handlers obviously have access doors, you know, a common one that's put in is downstream of the cooling coil to, you know, clean the coil and get at that drain pan. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so that's the end of the uh, questions, Dean. Oh, fantastic. So we are right, by, we're right on time, aren't we? Yeah, right, exactly now. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I um, sure, I appreciate everybody's time and thank you so much. Uh, 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 you can certainly contact me. I left uh, uh, some information at the end and I know Jim can send my information out. I'll put the contact information back up on the screen and Jim, I know you want to kind of close it out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks once again, uh, Dean. You know, great presentation. Um, you know, if you, if you do have any additional questions, you can email my, uh, myself or Dean and uh, we'll get those out. And then just to uh, summarize, we're going to uh, do what we normally do. We'll uh, resend the, uh, the slide deck. We'll summarize the question and answers. I'll take some liberties and try to retype them a, a little bit, uh, you know, more flowing. <laughs> We'll send you a link to this recording 
And then if you do have a chance, please uh, uh, fill out the survey. Always helps us uh, going forward with um, our presentations. We do have PDH credits available that we can send to you. Just let me know. And then just upcoming um, webinars, November 8th, we're going to do another one on um, uh, indoor air quality. And then I'm still trying to figure out whether it's going to be the uh, beginning of December or wait till after the holidays to the end of January. But I'm going to do one um, on cold climate uh, airside heat pumps uh, and packaged rooftop units. So, but anyway, so thank you all once again for attending. I really appreciate your time. Appreciate you guys uh, tuning in with us. Thank you again, everyone. Appreciate your time.